It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. For those who may be visiting today, we have been doing a series dealing with the book of Revelation. Now this is not a, a thorough, exhaustive study, it's, it's really an overview. And so we've been calling this an overview of Revelation. Today we're in the fifth presentation. We try to cover a few chapters at a time. And a uh, nickname for the series is the Apocalypse Synopsis. So this is part five. And by the way, I like to remind people, I've done it a couple of times along the way, there is a website we recommend that has a lot more information because we can't, we're just giving brief high points as we kind of get the overview of Revelation. And it's a website called BibleProphecyTruth.com. It's uh, one of the Amazing Facts websites, uh, probably the second most popular next to our basic home website. Bible Prophecy Truth got a lot of information on Bible prophecy, including the chapters we're talking about today. Today we're going to be talking about chapters 14 through 16. We're talking about the three angels' message and the seven last plagues. And uh, I'll be doing that. Uh, I've got a lot to cover, so I'll try and do it quickly. There'll probably be two more presentations in the series. Uh, the next one dealing with the themes of Revelation 17, 18, 19, and then 20 through, we're going to get you in heaven before it's over. And so I'll probably end up with, uh, that would make sense, series on Revelation with seven presentations. That's a good biblical revelation number. Anyway, um, you know, at our house, we're very thankful. I had someone knock on the door a few years ago, and they said, we're coming through because we live on Arcade Creek, they said we're, we're bringing the, uh, some of the first fiber optic cable into this neighborhood. And I did a little research to find out what is fiber optics. And uh, the amount of information that can be pushed through just a typical wire has some downsides. It's limited. If you get your internet or TV or whatever it is through, you know, copper cable, the old TV cable that comes in, they can cram a lot of digital information in there, but not like they can with fiber. They've been doing more and more tests. For one thing, uh, fiber is a little glass wire, and they send the information not so much through electricity as through light. It's information that is going through light impulses through that wire. And of course, light travels at the speed of light. The other neat thing about fiber is it doesn't get the interference from radio frequencies or other electric apparatus. So you can run fiber cables through all kinds of electronic components. It doesn't interrupt with the signal at all because it's not an electric signal per se. Nippon Telephone Corporation, just to give you an idea of how much information that they can take through one of these hair-like glass fibers in a fiber optic cable, uh, they're able to send 69.1 terabytes per second. You know what a terabyte is? You know what a megabyte is? And then you got the gigabyte. And then you got terabytes. Is that next? Uh, yeah. It's how much? 1,000 gigabytes. It's a terabyte. Yeah. And they divide that up then into 432 channels that each have 171 gigabytes that can come pouring through this almost microscopic glass fiber and they when they test them they send it over uh, 240 kilometers that's how far it can go and that's how much can go through this glass fiber and it's information that is traveling at the speed of light through light you know in the book of Revelation it tells about these angels that are bringing information in the last days to the world just before Jesus comes. Now, where we left off last time in our study, we were talking about Revelation chapter 13. It, we identified this beast, and the beast has a mark. And it's uh, those who do not receive the mark are going to be persecuted. But that beast is the enemy. 
Now when you swing into chapter 14, it begins by talking again about a group that are not marked by the mark of the beast, but they're marked by the mark of God. It's called the seal of God, and we already studied this group. They are the 144,000 sealed saints that have their father's name in their forehead. And often when we think about the last days and people talk about the beast, we always have a tendency to think about the mark of the beast prominently, but what we really want to be interested in is the seal of God. And we talked about that when we talked about the 144,000. Now, it numbers this group, and it says there's 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. That's how you come up with this number, 144,000. Right after it mentions the 144,000, then it introduces these three angel messages that go to the world just prior to Christ's coming. It's interesting that it juxtaposes the group that are spiritual Israel with a message that then goes to the whole world. It's like the spiritual Gentiles. And so we're going to take these messages apart one by one and look at them with a little more detail. Now, before we get into three angels, I thought it might be interesting to talk about angels. Just to help you know how prominent angels are in the book of Revelation. There is no book in the Bible that has more to say about angels than Revelation. Just a few facts. There are about 300 references to angels in the Bible. Not always called angels per se, but about 300 references. Um, of the 300 references to angels in the Bible, 76 of them are in Revelation. So what is that? About 25% of all the references to angels are in the book of Revelation. Not only all angels are, are good, and even in the book of Revelation, it talks in chapter 12 about the devil was cast out and his angels. So Revelation gives us a lot of information. It tells us there are good angels with good messages. There are bad angels that go forth to the kings of the earth to deceive. They're called devils, fallen angels, evil spirits. And sometimes they're called, in the Old Testament, it uses the word seraphim or malik, which means messenger or dispatchers. Uh, you know, you might have at the uh, police station a police dispatcher, or they're dispatching messages for God. In the New Testament, you've got the word angelos, which also means messenger. Now, I say that because when we now get to the first angel's message that you find in Revelation chapter 14, and if you have your Bibles, I hope you're in Revelation 14 now, it tells about this angel, Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel, and you've got angels appearing all through the book, so it's normal for him to say another angel, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice. Now what does this angel mean? flying in the midst of heaven. It's a position of visibility. Flying is telling us it goes quickly, and it tells us who it goes to. It's a global message. Now, I've had fun uh, talking with Danny Shelton of 3ABN. I said, uh, you know, I've got an active imagination, and I thought, you know, right now, as I speak uh, these messages are actually not now. It'll be, it'll be recorded, and this is not going up live. This is live on the Internet, so it is going by fiber, you might say. But uh, it'll be recorded, and it'll be bounced off satellite that have these great big solar wings that are capturing light, turning it into electricity, so they can take these signals that have these messages and bounce them globally in a matter, it takes half a second for these messages to go 23,000 miles up to a satellite that is in a geocentric orbit, bounce it back down to other places on a round world. That's the only way you can you know, get it to hop around the world like that so quickly. I've watched it before in the studio where you see the message live. You look out the window, you see they're actually speaking. You see the cameras recording it. Then you look at the satellite feed. Whenever we do a satellite meeting, it says, now this is what's going out over the air, and it's always got a half a second delay. It's amazing to me, 46,000 miles in half a second. 
So this message is going with great speed. And keep in mind, everything you're reading in Revelation also has echoes of the Gospels. Where did Jesus tell us that the Gospels to go? So go ye there and teach to all nations. Now, when did the everlasting Gospel begin to be preached? Was that when Christ ascended to heaven? I'd like to submit to you that the Gospel began being preached when God gave Adam and Eve their coats of skin. The good news that there was a substitute for man's sin. But in the last days in particular, during the time of the beast and the mark of the beast, there is going to be a new power because it says this angel is going with great speed and great volume. It says with a loud voice. I was talking to someone last night, and uh, actually it was yesterday afternoon. And they were asking me, this is not a member of our church, and they were asking me about the signs of the end. And I said, one of the greatest signs, Jesus said, the gospel of this kingdom will go into all the world for a witness unto all nations. Doesn't mean everyone's going to believe. It means they'll all have an opportunity. There is no other time in history like this generation where through radio, television, satellite, internet, the gospel is going to all the world. Yeah, I know a lot of other things are using these means of communication, but the gospel is also going. And so it is just astounding to me that uh, how quickly it is going, how fast it is going. That's why I really believe this is the last generation. Jesus is not nebulous about that. He says the gospel will go into all the world. He doesn't say then the end might come, could come, may come. He says it shall come. Do you believe Jesus? He doesn't say everyone will be belie believers and there'll be a global revival. He says that for a witness, people will have an opportunity. And then the end will come. So this is a message that is going. Now it tells you the particulars of that message. And matter of fact, I, I need to read this to you right out of, well, I guess we got it up on the screen. And the gospel will go to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And here's what it says. Verse 7, Revelation saying with a loud voice, fear God, you might underscore that, and give glory to Him, underscore glory, for the hour of His judgment is come, time of judgment, notice that, and worship Him that made, worship the Creator, notice the words heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. So you've got four points we especially want to notice. It says fear God, says, give glory to God. I think we're going to put these four points up on the screen. These are the high points of the third angel's message. You've got fear God, give glory to God, the hour of His judgment has come, and worship the Creator. These are some of the, the particulars I want you to notice of the first angel's message. Now what does it mean to fear God? I can, I've got a whole sermon on that. But put very quickly, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. So what does it mean when it says Job was a man that feared God and hated evil? It's talking about someone that has reverence for God. They realize that we will answer to God. They have respect for God. They live where God is their primary concern. They're not like the Pharisees that are worried about what men think of them. They're worried about what God thinks of them. So this is what it means to be God-fearing in the last days. Then it says, to glorify God. Live a life that brings glory to God. Well, let me ask you, assuming that you know you are here, that you are breathing, why? Why did God make man? Why are we alive? What is our purpose? The reason we exist is to bring glory to God. By the way, that is where you will find your highest satisfaction and joy, is when you really live a life of bringing glory to God. That's where you find happiness. So the purpose of life, what is sin? We have all sinned, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and done what? Fallen short of the glory. He doesn't say we completely missed it, but we've fallen short of it. We fail to bring God His full glory. And Paul tells us that our lives can be completely immersed in glorifying God. Matter of fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, therefore whether you eat, whether you drink, 
Or whatever you do, what you say, where you go, what you wear, whatever you do, do all, live a life of glorifying God. And so this is a people in the last days that they revere God and they want to live lives that will glorify God. <clears throat> Next aspect of the third angel's message we're considering, it says, for the hour of his judgment is come. In other words, this people needs to fear God and glorify God because they've entered the first phase of God's judgment. Now, again, this is an overview, and you might be saying, Doug, you need to talk more about these things. I can't. This is a review. I'm already in trouble. It was to be a two-part series. It's now seven parts because I'm taking more time. There are three phases to God's judgment. One phase of judgment happens before Jesus comes. Now, it really is easy to figure that out. It says in Revelation, Behold, as he comes, every eye will see him. My reward is with me. So if God is dispensing rewards when he comes, does it make sense to you some investigation happens before he comes? It does not make sense for him to come, take one group to heaven, throw another group in the lake of fire and say, okay, now let's have a judgment and find out who's innocent and guilty. Some investigation happens before he comes. That's called the pre-advent judgment or the investigative judgment. It's in the Bible. You can read about this, for instance, in Ezekiel 9. Some of you have read that very frightening prophecy in Ezekiel 9. By the way, it talks about those who get the mark of God and they are saved. Those who do not have the seal of God, the mark of God in Ezekiel 9, are destroyed. And what does it say? Utterly slay, Ezekiel 9, verse 6, old and young, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. This is the mark of God, the good mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Begin where? Who does this first judgment begin with? Those who profess to have accepted the plan of salvation to basically test their authenticity. 1 Peter 4.17 For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begins at us, what will be the end of them that obey not the gospel? So this first phase of judgment, by the way, when you go through the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the last church is called what? Laodicea. Do you remember what I told you the word Laodicea means? A judging of the people. So when the age of Laodicea begins, you enter the last phase of church history. It's also when the pre-advent judgment begins. We're living in this time that is a parallel for the Day of Atonement for the Jewish people or Yom Kippur. And it was a time when they would examine themselves because it was the end of their, their uh, religious year. It was a time of putting away of sin. And so Christ is coming. We've entered a parallel of that time. Some of you remember the story in the Bible when a woman, who I believe was Mary Magdalene, caught in the act of adultery is brought to the temple and they are going to stone her in the temple. And Christ intercedes in her behalf. And it says that this judgment began with the ancient men, beginning at the eldest, even unto the least, they went out one by one. They were going to judge her. What does a woman represent in prophecy or in symbology? There's something to that. Here is a judgment in the house of God that begins with the eldest. And you know, that's exactly what it says in Ezekiel 9. So there's a lot of parallels in here. And, um, and then it's calling us the last part of the first angel's message. Remember, four things. Fear God, glorify God, We've entered a time of judgment just before the end. Worship the Creator. Worship Him that made. Has there ever been a generation that needed that message more? By the way, when we entered this last phase of the church, many believe that was around 1844, the church of Laodicea began. This time of judgment began. You know what else began? Darwin wrote his manuscript on the origin of thesis. Karl Marx was releasing his philosophy about communism. Both are rooted in atheism. And through the influence of those two people, you had the birth of communism and atheism and evolutionary thinking, which denies the Creator. It deletes the Creator. And so there is a call in the last days for people to awaken from 
this hypnotism that's happened to our society that says that we just happen by accident that there's no creator. It's a call back to worship the creator. Now, notice the wording. It says here, worship him that made. An invitation to worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Now, remember, out of the 404 verses in Revelation, 276 are almost perfectly drawn from other parts of the Bible. Where do you think that phrase comes from? Look in Exodus chapter 20 in the Ten Commandments, and it tells us in the middle of God's law, the one commandment that says remember, the one commandment that says holy, talks about worshiping the Creator. For in six days the Lord made, we didn't evolve, the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. See, God's people in the last days, these messages that are going to the world are messages of restoration of truth. They're being restored to Bible truth, including the commandments of God. Remember we read in Revelation chapter 12, 17, the dragon makes war. We'll get to the battle of Armageddon later today. The dragon makes war with the remnant of God's people. They have had a revival. They return to the faith that was delivered to the saints who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And so part of that is all the commandments, including the Sabbath truth, being restored. So this is the first angel's message. Now we go to the second angel's message. Not as long, but it's power-packed. Second angel's message, you find it tells us Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now notice what's happening over and over again. In Revelation uh, chapter 13, it talks about the beast and this war that's being made, and then you go a little further and it explains more about what's going to happen to the beast. And then it's talking here in... Uh, chapter 14 about Babylon well when you get to chapter 17 it identifies who Babylon is and that will be in our next study and so you keep finding it's overlapping uh, back and forth to try and give the picture it'll introduce a subject well here it tells us that Babylon is fallen is fallen when you get to chapter 18 it gives more detail remember we first heard about the 144,000 in chapter 7 now we're in chapter 14 more detail it's telling us about Babylon falling here in chapter 14, chapter 18, more detail. What's that extra detail in chapter 18? I heard another voice out of heaven saying, not only is Babylon fallen, it says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Chapter 15 and 16 tell about the plagues. You're going to fall on Babylon. So we've got to know who that is. And we know that if we don't come out of Babylon, what do we get? Plagues fall on us. So those people need to come out of Babylon. Now, why does it say Babylon is fallen? Is fallen. You got two Babylons in the Bible that fall, so to speak. By the way, when something falls twice, it doesn't rise again. It's talking about, um, you got Babylon fell in the Old Testament and God's people were able to come out of Babylon. When Babylon fell, because the Medo-Persians attacked, they allowed all the Jews to go back to the Promised Land. Now when spiritual Babylon falls in the last days, it means we, God's people, are going to be able to go to the Promised Land. But we must be willing to come out. Those who stayed in Babylon suffered. And in the same way, if we stay in Babylon, um, there will be plagues that will fall. Third angel's message. Now, I'm not going to say much more about Babylon because we've got another study coming on that. Revelation 14, verses 9 and 10. And we read here, If any man worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself also will drink the wine of the wrath of God. Now, you might underline wrath of God there. Wrath of God now is going to be explained in the next chapters. He will drink the wine of the wrath of God that is poured out full mixture, without mixture, into the cup of his indignation. So 
you know, God often, when he sends judgments, he's good. He mixes his judgments with mercy. And uh, God is very kind. But when this final judgment comes, you know why God often mixes his judgments with mercy? He wants us to repent. But will there be anybody repenting when the seven plagues fall out? When the wrath of God comes, which are the seven last plagues, at that point, probation closes. Jesus will declare, as it says in Revelation 22, he that is just, let him be just still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is holy, he is holy still. And righteous, he that is unrighteous, is unrighteous still. And so, people's, there's no more changing teams. People's destinies are eternally fixed. You remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Abraham said to that rich man, there is a great gulf fixed. No swapping anymore at that point. And so that's why there's no mixture. Now they're getting their, their judgment. It's not to be redemptive. It's just what they deserve. And it says, if any man worships the beast in his image, that was introduced in the former chapter, and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he will drink the wine of the wrath. Now how important is it that we don't receive the mark of the beast? You know, I've had people say to me many times, you know, Doug, I don't read the Old Testament. It's, you know, the God in the Old Testament seems severe. You got war, and you got death, and you got plagues, and, and I like the God of the New Testament. He's loving and kind and forgiving. But you know, the most fearful plagues that you find and the most, the scariest denunciations are in the New Testament. I mean, you read some of the things Paul said. Paul was very clear. Such will not enter the kingdom of God. And he talks about the judgment of God. And here it says they're going to drink the wine of God's wrath without mixture and smoke it sends up forever and ever and they have no rest day and night. And that's New Testament. So when people say that, you know what it is? It's ignorance. They're just not reading the Bible. But if you read the Bible, you'll find out you got plagues in the New and the Old Testament. You got grace and gospel in the New and the Old Testament. It's all the Bible. It's all there. It's all the Word of God. Anyway, so the wrath is introduced in the third angel's message, a warning to come out. Now, you read, go back to chapter 14, and uh, I guess you were already there. I had to go back to chapter 14. And it goes on and says, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. First of all, those who do not have Jesus have no rest. Is that clear to everybody? Jesus says, come unto me and I will give you rest. You don't come unto him, you don't have rest. Now what does it mean when it says it's the smoke ascends up forever and ever? Doesn't that mean that it just it goes up forever and ever and ever, smoke ascending up? There's a couple ways you might say the smoke ascends up forever. One way you could say it is the smoke ascends up out of sight as far as you can see. You know, when there's a big fire, you might not see how far that smoke ascends. The other means it keeps ascending forever and ever. We know it's not talking about that because it says that those who are cast in the lake of fire, this is the second death. Furthermore, it tells us that the wicked will consume away into smoke. There will not be a coal to warm at. Malachi chapter 4 says they will be burnt up. They are ashes. So what he's talking about is this judgment, when it comes, the smoke is just reaching up into the heavens and for all to see. And then you read on, after it talks about this, it contrasts those in verse 12, or verse 11 tells about those who have no rest, who have the mark of the beast, and it contrasts them with those who are saved. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those, once again, who keep the commandments of God. And notice, the faith doesn't say faith in Jesus. It says the faith of Jesus. What kind of faith do we want to have? Not just faith in Jesus, but we want to have the faith of Jesus. There are a lot of different kinds of faith in the world out there today. And people say, I don't care what faith you are. We can all love each other regardless of our faith. And yeah, we might all love each other, but that's not all saving faith. Saving faith is not just faith in Jesus, it's the faith of Jesus. The kind of faith that Christ had in the Father, we need in Christ. And it's the faith in the truth that Jesus had. So it's a very particular faith. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, 
says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. It'll be a good thing to be resting in the Lord before the plagues fall. You notice that? After these messages go to the world, Revelation chapter 14, three angels' messages, verse 14, I looked and behold a white cloud, and one sat like the Son of Man on the cloud, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple. All of Revelation happens in the context of the heavenly temple. On the cloud, and he says, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. For 6,000 years, Jesus has been sowing the seed of the gospel. And now he's coming with his sickle, and he's going to harvest the earth. And he who sat upon the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Hasn't Jesus said the harvest is great, the labors are few, the word of God is that seed, he wants us to be out there. What will the wicked declare? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. All of salvation is kind of in the context of a harvest. And so, and the devil has been sowing tares among the wheat, right? Or weeds among the wheat. And here it's though it's in the harvest more grapes. Any of you ever sung that song? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trampled out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. That's drawn from what we're about to read. Talking about this awesome judgment. So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and he gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God and the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 furlongs. That's not a pretty picture, but of course, I think everyone realizes there's a lot of symbols in these images here. Uh, the world is not going to run with blood up to a horse's bridle when Jesus comes. That is a picture when they went into battle, first of all, they often fought near rivers and many times those rivers were running with blood. It happened during the Civil War. Many battles have been like that. It's hard to cross a river with a horse and stay on the horse. Once the water gets up to his bridle, the horse then has to swim. He can't walk across the river anymore. It makes it difficult. And so it's a picture of this barrier of judgment that's happening. Now, I did a study last night. I even talked to Don McIntosh afterward, and I said, help me understand, why does it say 1,600 furlongs? It's about 200 miles. All the numbers mean something in the Bible, and I looked at the different commentators. Number doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible. Did you know that? 1,600. It'll have 1,600 in this and that, but 1,600. Well, of course, it's, it's a number that's divisible by four, some have suggested that's what you get when you circumnavigate the uh, promised land. And so, I don't know exactly what that means, but uh, it's talking about how far and how deep this blood was going to run. It's a great judgment. Now, notice what happens. After these three angel messages go to the world, then it says, Jesus comes in the clouds. And so the next thing that happens is the coming of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean Revelation's over and Jesus has come. Jesus comes several times in Revelation. Jesus comes at the end of the seven churches when he says to the Laodicean church, Amen, I stand at the door. Jesus comes at the end of the seven trumpets. Jesus comes at the end of several of the, the seven seals. And so you always find these different um, snapshots of history they end with the great climax of Jesus coming, and this is the case here. After the three angel messages go to the world, Jesus comes. Any of you ever noticed? We got a mosaic here in the church of Jesus, but have you noticed the other mosaic on the front outside? We've got it right here. This is actually, I did this, I don't know if you know that. I copied this. I didn't do the podium, I did the, the picture, and then I gave it to the artist. But that's a copy, we took a picture and I framed it in Photoshop of the three angels on the front of our church. Any you ever notice a three angel mosaic out there? So that's based on these three angel messages that we want to carry to the world. And so why? Because then Christ comes. Gospels preached everywhere. Now Revelation chapter 15, 16. And I'm going to go through this quickly. You find in chapter 15 that he introduces 
that this great judgment is about to come. And it's talking about the redeemed they see on a sea of glass. They sing the song of Moses and the song of God, the song of the Lamb. Why? When the plagues begin to fall, probation is closed. As it says in Daniel chapter 12, Michael will stand up. The great prince that stands for the children of thy people. You know when a judge stands up, you know what that means? First of all, if you've been in a courtroom and the judge comes in, they say, all rise, and they say the name of the judge, the honorable so-and-so, and everyone stands up. Judge sits down, he listens to evidence, he weighs evidence, when he bangs that gavel down, case closed, he gets up, you don't bother saying anything else, judgment's over. No more intercession, no more pleading. It's telling us when Michael stands up, the judgment's over. The saved are saved, the lost are lost. Now that's bad news for the lost, it's good news for the saved. They're on the other side now of the Red Sea. Like when Miriam crossed over and they saw the Egyptians dead when the plagues fell on Egypt and they sang the song of Moses, that song of victory. So you'll, you'll find that in the Bible. By the way, you can find this in Exodus 15, 14. We're getting ready to go into the seven plagues. Now where do you find a pile of plagues in the Bible? Before the children of Israel left for the promised land, what happened to Egypt? Plagues. How many plagues? Ten plagues. Now, Pastor Doug, that doesn't make sense. How come there's seven in Revelation? Some of the plagues are similar. But there's ten in Exodus. Well, there is seven particular plagues in Exodus. The first three of the ten plagues that fell on the Egyptians were also experienced by the Israelites. The last seven plagues that fell on Israel, God protected Israel from those plagues. And so you notice that it was dark in Israel, light or dark in Egypt, light in Israel. Plague falls, hail falls in Egypt, doesn't fall in Goshen. He ends up protecting them through those. When the seven last plagues fall, will God protect his people? You notice we started with Psalm 91 as our scripture reading, neither will any plague come nigh his dwelling. When people think about the last days and say, oh, Pastor Doug, I don't know if I'm going to make it through the plagues. I'm so worried about the plagues. I think if you're saved up to the plagues, you're home free. Don't worry about it. It says your bread is sure, your water is sure. You don't have anything to worry about at that point. My worry is I just want to be faithful. If I make it till Michael stands up, well, the world's going to fall apart around you, but under his wings, he protects you. So as we read about these plagues, don't wring your hands worrying about the plagues. Make sure you're saved and you won't have to worry about the plagues. You know, people, I, I got to make sure I don't run out of time. I talk to my friends that believe in the secret rapture. Now, we believe in the rapture in that they will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, right? We don't believe in the secret rapture. And, you know, the left behind scenario is that Christ raptures some away and the rest of people have to stay down here and they go through the plagues here on earth, the righteous and the wicked, and, and uh, seven years of tribulation. You've probably heard about that, even though it's not in the Bible. You don't find seven years of tribulation anywhere in the Bible. And... Uh, and they say, oh, I, I'm so scared that I might have to live through the tribulation. I think, if you're saved, why would you worry about that? And so I said, I'm not the least bit worried about the plagues. If God protected the Israelites during the plagues, is he going to protect modern Israel? So don't, don't worry about these things as we dive into them here. So they rejoice and they sing that song of Moses and the Lamb. Verse 5, chapter 15. I saw and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony was open in heaven. And out of the temple came the seven angels having seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen having their chests girded with golden bands. That's the way Jesus appears in chapter 1. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and, and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now, what happened in the temple? Atonement was made, intercession, redemption, forgiveness. The fact that no one can go in the temple means atonement is over. The redemption is over. By the way, do you know there's another place in the Bible where it says they couldn't enter the temple because of the glory of God? When Solomon's temple was dedicated, you don't find this in 1 Kings. You do find it where it tells the story in 1 Chronicles. When the first offering was made, they put it on the altar, just like Moses did 
fire came down from God, he ignited the first sacrifice, they from then on were to use those coals from that holy fire for every other fire in the temple. It was called holy fire, ignited by God. The Lord lit that fire. It happened in the wilderness when they inaugurated that temple. When Solomon built his temple, the fire of God came down that says the Shekinah glory of the Lord filled the temple so the priests could not minister because the glory of God was so intense. So it's either John knew his Bible really well and made all these things up or everything in Revelation links back to another story in the Bible. They couldn't even minister. So when it tells us the smoke is in the temple, it's saying intercession has ceased for man at this point. Now it tells us, verse 1, chapter 16, about the plagues begin to come. Then I heard the voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of wrath of God on the earth. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome, that means a bad smelling, and an obnoxious sore or boil, came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Now this, I believe, is literal. Uh, you know, and sometimes it's hard to know where do you transition between, is this just a symbol or is this literal? Were there literal plagues that fell in the Old Testament? Now that probation is closed, the, the needs for these symbols is, uh, is not as strong. And so I think this is a real sore. Now I won't ask for a show of hands, but I don't know if you've ever had a boil. I'm not talking about pimple. Most of us have had a pimple at some point. A boil is different. It's a lot bigger. It's kind of under the skin, and it's throbbing. It's loathsome. It smells. And it's basically saying these people who rejected the seal of God and took the mark of the beast, they're being flagged physically for destruction. They're being branded for destruction by this boil. And so this is the first, um, the first plague is this painful boil. By the way, what happened when they failed to worship God, when the Philistines stole the ark of God? What happened to the Philistines? 1 Samuel 5, 9, So it was after they carried away the ark, the hand of the Lord was against the city and a very great destruction, and he struck the men of the city, small and great, with tumors broke out on them. 1 Samuel 5, 12, And the men who did not die were stricken with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven and they were crying, oh, the pain, the pain. Finally, they gave the ark back. It was because they had stolen and defiled the ark of God, the law of God is in the ark. Isn't that right? Tumors. What happened to Job when God withdrew his protection from Job covered with boils? And this is just one very bad boil. Well, that's enough about boils. Number two, a plague strikes the sea. And that's chapter 16, verse 3. It tells us that the sea is as the blood of a dead man. Now, it doesn't say it becomes the blood. It is as the blood. A dead man being dark, thick, and congealed. I know that's not pretty, but you know what some have said, and it makes you think. I'm not, I'm not voting on this right now, but it is making me think. Some have said, well, you know, they just had this big old oil spill in the Gulf, and they say it's, you know, the worst in American history. And, and uh, that we're set up where if there was some kind of geological earthquake, all these wells, the, the whole, if all the wells that are in the ocean right now suddenly broke because of some catastrophic, catastrophic earthquake, man, you'd have just the, all the shores would be washing up oil and, and it's dark. Some of it's red. Depends on what kind of crude it is. It's like a reddish, dark, it congeals, it kills things in the sea. And I don't know. I just thought it'd be worth thinking about. What that is is hard to pinpoint. It says it's as the blood of a dead man. Oh, by the way, have you noticed the parallels as we go through the plagues? I didn't want to miss this. When it talks about the seven plagues, look at the similarities between the seven trumpets that we've studied. The first four of the seven plagues and the trumpets talk about the earth, sea, rivers, springs, and heavenly bodies. The fifth trumpet and plague deals with darkness. The sixth mentions the Euphrates River. 
The seventh, loud voices and noises. Such a mathematically perfect book. The other thing I was looking at, the parallels between the plagues in creation. Look at the words that are mentioned in creation and go to the seven last plagues. The seven last plagues are creation in reverse. The whole creation right now is groaning and travailing and when the seven plagues come, you've got creation going backwards. Whole creation is imploding. It mentions in creation, in the plagues and creation, God, man, earth, the number seven, Euphrates, sun, water, darkness. A lot of the language that you find in creation suddenly appears in the seven last plagues, but it's going backwards. All right, where did I leave you? I think I left you with oceans of blood. Now we're going to go springs of water. The third plague strikes the rivers and springs. Now this is a plague that also affected Egypt. The Nile turned to blood. And it says, here it doesn't say as blood. It says turns to blood. It's, it's pretty clear. Remember Moses, Exodus 7, lifted up his rod and smote the waters that were in Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and all the waters in the river turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink the water. What's going to happen? Most of the world's population now lives in the cities. Wasn't that way, it's mostly rural. You go back a hundred years. Where are most cities located? Two spots, rivers and oceans. It's either San Francisco on the ocean or Sacramento on the river, right? But the majority of the populations of the world are located by rivers because you need water for life or the, the bounty of the sea, usually where a river runs to the ocean, by the way. Now that's being plagued. What's that going to do to the population of the world? Fourth plague, the sun strikes, the plague strikes the sun, burning heat. What is it that most world religions worship? Sun worship. Now the supreme object of their worship is being struck. Luke 21, verse 25, Jesus warned, speaking of the last days, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity. Talk about the ultimate global warming. Men, someone's going to read this, men are being struck with great heat. Well, I think it's going to be a lot more than warming. I think it's gonna, the earth is going to be scorched. And can you imagine this? They got sores. These things are going to happen in quick succession, I think. How long will the seven last plagues last? Jesus said, except those days be short and no flesh would survive. Now, I can't tell you the exact time, but I have a theory. You read in Revelation 18 when it talks about the fall of Babylon, and it mentions one hour, one hour, one hour. If a day is a year, one hour is 15 days. Three times one hour is 45 days. Now, don't take too much out of this, but it is interesting to me that in Daniel 12, there's a 45-day difference between the 1290 and the 1335. I believe in the historic interpretation of prophecy, but I do think that's interesting. How long do you think the plagues lasted that fell on Job? Months? Years? Probably a few weeks, maybe 45 days. When the plagues fell on Egypt, when you add one and one, you put it together, some days are left out, but it all happens in a few weeks. It's very quick. So when the seven last plagues happen, I know it seems like God makes us wait forever, but you won't need to wait at that point because you're saved. I think it's going to happen quickly. And so, don't know, but based on what I see in the Bible, it seems like these final plagues, they happen in rapid succession, maybe a couple of months. It'll all happen. Can you imagine having those boils, not having clean drinking water, the, the oceans stink, and, I mean, the economies of the world are going to come to a standstill. You find that when we get to chapter 18. Anyway, cheer up. It's going to get worse. So, <laughs> burn, and then you have burning heat, nothing to drink. Plague 5, a plague of darkness on the throne of the beast. Now, this seems to be more located. Darkness also represents a lack of spiritual illumination. Darkness on the seat of the beast is telling us the beast has claimed to have great light. Jesus said, if the blind lead the blind, they'll all fall in a ditch. He says they're in darkness. And so their light is withdrawn. And this is also talking about the fall of Babylon, you'll find in chapter 18. Darkness on the seat of the beast. Was darkness one of the plagues that fell on ancient Egypt? A thick, palpable darkness that you could taste and feel. 
And so all of a sudden they're plunged into darkness. Talk about a blackout. All right, and then we get to, by the way, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 23, if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Therefore, if the light that is in you is darkness, then how great is that darkness? There's one verse, darkness, darkness, darkness. Jesus says three times. And he's talking about people that say, if you are spiritually blind, you'll be caught in terrible darkness at some point. Plague number six, the river Euphrates. Again, in the uh, trumpets, Euphrates is mentioned too. And it's telling these wick, wicked demonic spirits are released. Now, turn with me to chapter 16 of Revelation. And um, when it talks about this last plague, uh, you, you read about the um, darkness on the seat of the beast and the seventh bowl, finally. When the seventh angel pours out his bowl in the air, oh wait, one more thing, under, I'm sorry, under the sixth bowl, because I want to talk about Armageddon. It says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the beast. By the way, do frogs croak at night? Darkness doesn't bother frogs. And they catch things with their tongues. Coming out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils performing signs that go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And then it interjects here, just before this final showdown to annihilate the people of God, Jesus inserts a promise. Do you have red letter edition in your Bible? This is in red. Christ says, Behold, I'm coming. It's like saying, Don't give up. Hang on. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Then it finishes where they're being gathered for the battle. He gathers them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now that word Armageddon is a conundrum. It is a mystery. It is an enigma. Because you don't find the word. They haven't yet. Maybe someday they will. There is no ancient Hebrew literature that find you, where you find the word. Of course, it's written in Greek. Then they try and translate it over to Hebrew and they, they can't find that word. Nearest they can come is it's very similar to the word Megiddo. And they're wondering if it means Har Megiddo, which means the hill of Megiddo. And some have thought over there in Megiddo and all these armies are going to gather and there's going to be this great battle. And everyone's heard the word Armageddon because it represents the great final battle. Some think it means World War III. That'll be fought somehow between China and Russia and the U.S. and Israel and I don't know. There's all these different theories. Battle of Armageddon is not between political powers. The battle of Armageddon was already given to us in Revelation 12, 17. It is the dragon making war on the woman. It is those who have the mark of the beast making war on those who have the seal of God. It is a final war between those who worship the devil and have the mark of the devil wanting to destroy those who worship God. And so don't get distracted by some of these popular televangelists. You can't trust televangelists, can you? <laughs> that um, are, they got all these convoluted ideas about what the Battle of Armageddon is. It, the Bible's very clear what it is. Now, what does the word Armageddon mean? You know, like I said, I've told you it's somewhat of a conundrum, but I want to share with you, I've done some studies on it, and a number of major battles did happen near the Valley of Megiddo. The battle between Deborah and Balak and the forces of Sisera where God fought for his people. They had all these iron chariots. They were going to annihilate God's people, but he fought for them, and there was a miraculous deliverance. So it's telling us about that. But you know, there's also another great battle that happened by the Valley of Megiddo between a hero named Gideon where he divided his forces in three parts to fight against a three-part enemy. Now we've just learned in Revelation you got a three-part enemy. Beast, dragon, false prophet. Right? In Gideon's day it was the Amalekites, the Edomites, and the people of the east. I'm sorry, Midianites, Amalekites, and people of the east. And so you've got a lot of similarities. Now, if you look in the original Hebrew, and I think I've got the word Armageddon we're going to put up on the screen there. When God speaks to Gideon, and it says, Jehovah spoke to Gideon in Judges 7-2. Here's how it would look in the Hebrew. 
Yehovah Amar Gidoen. Now Moffat, who wrote his commentary, says Armageddon is talking about Gideon. And by the way, the word Gideon means a feller of trees, someone who cuts down the big trees. And it's saying that as God spoke to Gideon, and did God's people have to fight in the days of Gideon? Or did they blow the trumpets, they let their light shine, and the enemy destroyed himself? When you read in Revelation and Babylon falls, what happens? The enemy turns, the kings of the earth turn on the beast. They turn on each other. What did Moses say by the Red Sea to the children of Israel? Stand still and see the salvation of God. And the Lord fought for them. So what is it telling us about the battle of Armageddon? God is going to come. Jesus is going to come himself and fight for his people with all of his angels. And he will fight in our behalf. And so then it goes on, the seventh plague is poured out, and what does it say? It is done, Babylon falls. So God is telling us in, um, oh, by the way, you know, I think, yeah, in the verse of Joel chapter 3, verse 14, one more thing about the battle of Armageddon. It's happening in this valley. It says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So there was this great deliverance. God fought for Jehoshaphat in this valley and delivered them. All right, I've got to move on. Final plague it says it is done. Babylon falls. Now, when else do you find in the Bible where someone declared it is finished? When Jesus died on the cross. After it says it is done, under the seventh plague, there's a great earthquake. Was there an earthquake? Did the ground shake when Jesus said it is done back then? So when Christ said it was done and he died on the cross, was the devil and his angels rejoicing? They thought, we've got him now. He's dead. They sealed his body. Now the next time, this final vial, this final plague that's poured out, again Christ is saying it is done, but is he coming now as a defeated carpenter or is he coming as a conquering king the lion of the tribe of Judah he said it is done again and now it's not just that the salvation sacrifice is complete now the redemption is complete because God's people are caught up they'll get their glorified bodies never going to be touched by sin again Matthew 27 says the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom the earth quaked the rocks were split the graves opened Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Will that happen again when Jesus comes? So it's an echo of the things that happened at the cross. They're going to happen again, and Christ comes triumphantly. Well, friends, I'm looking forward to that day, aren't you? When Jesus comes again, and he comes with all of his angels.